Hey, good morning, church. It's uh, great to be here with you on Sunday morning, and uh, we're going to be pushing back into the Word of God and having a having a great time. It's been very exciting, actually, uh, going through the Book of Hebrews, and um, not only the Book of Hebrews, but all the side tracks that we seem to go down and things that we're discovering in the Word of God. And uh, I was saying to Nancy earlier, I'm a little bit excited about some of the things the Lord has been talking to me about, and I. Hope that uh, you find them to be an encouragement too as part of the church. Because we've been looking at uh, Hebrews and we've been looking at those phrases where the Lord says, let us. And um, the last phrase that we, we talked about was, uh, let us uh, come on or move on into perfection. And uh, we discussed that a little bit. At this time, we're going to talk about um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. And it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. So th this is uh, quite an exciting scripture because it says... Um, let us, let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance and faith. But it's talking here about um, actually going into the holy, right into the holy of holies of God. And one of the amazing things about the new covenant is that instead of just a high priest who could go into the holy of holies uh, once a year to offer the sacrifices as an atonement for sin, uh, now that through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, we have access uh, into the Holy of Holies, basically any time that we uh, want to go in and be into the presence of the Lord. It was, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that um, uh, during the time of uh, Christ, there were a lot of other historians and other people writing. They weren't all writing uh, things that were actually included in the scriptures, but a lot of the things were historical writings and stuff like that. Josephus, uh, Josephus is one of the historians that wrote around the time of Jesus Christ, and he provides a lot of historical content to actually what was actually happening in the day, in the life of Christ, in the church, in Judaism, and the things that were taking place. One of, one of the historians I just read recently uh, had made a comment that um, historically they say that after the curtain was torn, um, making access into the Holy of Holies, that the actual priest sewed the curtain back together because they did not want the people to see what had actually taken place uh, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's an interesting thing because in Matthew 27, 50, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Uh, amazing events that took place and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the graves were opened, the dead came um, alive again, and then they went and showed themselves in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus himself came back and revealed himself in the city of Jerusalem. But we see here that at that moment when the Lord gave up his life um, on that cross, that the, the, uh, the veil into the Holy of Holies was torn from the top to the bottom, representing that God, uh, the Son of God, had made a way. But it's interesting in history that they said that the priests, who were still trying to hold on to their old ways and to their old temple worship and were not going to recognize the Messiah, were not going to receive the Messiah, uh, interesting that history would say that they sewed the veil back together so that the people wouldn't understand exactly what had actually taken place. So um, now we have the right to enter into the Holy of Holies through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I've been thinking quite a lot about some of these things. And, and uh, one of the things that uh, has encouraged me about being filled with the Holy Spirit, we know that it's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ we can enter into the Holy of Holies. But also what gives us this added assurance and added confidence is being filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, we know about um, the Holy of Holies as a holy place. We know Christ is holy. We know the Holy Spirit is a holy spirit. We know our Heavenly Father God is a holy God. And that assurance of being born again by the Spirit of God and filled and baptized 
uh, by the Holy Ghost and entering into the Holy of Holies is just a, another level of uh, reassurance. The, um, it's interesting because um, uh, they wanted to maintain the temple worship and uh, Nancy, when she went to Jerusalem a few years ago, she came back and said that she'd seen the plans uh, for the third temple, for this temple that uh, the Jews are still wanting to build another temple. They're still wanting to set up and go back to the old um, uh, sacrifices. They're still wanting to just be believers in the Torah and uh, not believers in the Messiah, not believers in the, in the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, I know that I've said this before in, um, um, about the, the second temple it's really interesting. I don't know why historians and people try to roll the second temple into the third temple. Um, it says, um, I was reading another a thing about the temple that was built under Zerubbabel. It said, according to the Bible, the second temple was originally a rather modest structure constructed by a number of the Jewish exile groups returning from Babylon under the governor Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua. However, during the reign of Herod the Great, the second temple, which, which is actually, to my mind, it's the third, but they want to say it's the continuation, was completely refurbished and the original structure was totally overhauled into the large and magnificent edifice uh, and, and the facades that are more recognisable. It's, it's an interesting thing because I want to read to you here from the book of Haggai, um, Chapter 2, verses 1 and 9, because these scriptures, prophetic from the prophet Haggai, are talking specifically about this temple. So it says in Haggai chapter 2, In the seventh month of the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shelal, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who was left among you who saw the temple in its former glory. And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, so do not fear. And then he goes on a little bit more. Verse 6, he says, For thus the Lord of hosts, once more, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to desire all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this, latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Now I know <coughs> I know what they do. I know <coughs> that they um they say that this is prophetic and it's going to be um, the temple that brings about peace is the temple of the Lord that the Lord is building. But it's also you've got to say also you've got to recognize that there is an actual temple that is built and it's prophetically built and it's actually built. And it, and it is a prophetic temple, um, but I, I, I um, still want to maintain that Zerubbabel's temple is significant. Zerubbabel's temple was actually built, and then later on, even though it was a refurbishment, Herod's temple was built. So I think, in my mind, you can disagree with this, but I think there's te three temples that have been built. Now, one of the other things that I discovered that's just really, really interesting and you might want to go to your Bibles and have a look at that, but there's no evidence in the scriptures that I could find anyway that Zerubbabel's temple had the Ark of the Covenant. So Joshua's temple was a temple without the Ark, but the other interesting thing is um, a Herod's temple didn't have the Ark. It, it doesn't appear, and I did a research through the scriptures and that, and somebody might know of an obscure scripture or something that I couldn't find, so we've got this interesting thing where you've got two temples that have been built without the Ark of the Covenant. So what's the use of a temple without the presence of God? You know, what's the use of our earthly temple, our human temple, without the presence of God? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, uh, if, you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you realise how significant our earthly temple is once we're filled with the presence of the Holy Ghost. 
So you've got these two temples that are void of God. Now, that's an interesting thing. The, the other thing that's really interesting is um, uh, the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, and we appear to have 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. There's around about 400 years where God has been silent. <clears throat> and what temples are erected, what temples are actually there during that period of time? These temples. These temples that don't appear to have the presence of God on them, the Ark of the Covenant, and then we have 400 years where God is not actually communicating um, uh, to his people on earth. Now, I, what I believe is that this is also prophetic. It's a preparation for the time when Jesus Christ would come. Because as soon as Jesus Christ comes onto the face of the earth, the, <clears throat> the, um, the temple worship is doomed. But prophetically, the temple worship from what I can see and understand here, it's already fallen over. It's already fallen over. So they're going through the rituals without the presence of God. They're going through uh, the sacrifices without the Ark of the Covenant. And so when you look at this, it think, you think, oh, man, what on earth was going on? What were these people actually thinking? But it's no coincidence, I believe, that there was no Ark. No Ark, no presence of God <coughs> in these temples. I believe that it was a prophetic sign showing what was coming. It was actually another sign saying, look, the days of the temple are over, the days of the natural, physical temple are over, and the days of the temple of the Lord, where we are the living stones, where God is building a temple out of us, and God is going to inhabit us, his temple. I don't, I don't know about you, that, that actually gets me, um, gets me excited. So there's two temples, um, <clears throat> Zerubbabel's and Herod's, both of them, seem to appear to be without the Ark of the Covenant, without the presence of God. So um, <clears throat> I think what we've got to understand, the other thing too is that it, it does make some sense around, a little bit around the desecration of the temples and that as well. Um, because when we actually go in a little bit further into some of the prophetic revelation around the um, uh, desolation of destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, it, it's really interesting how... <clears throat> Some of these things actually tie together. It goes on in, uh, in Hebrews then, and the next one is, uh, it says this, let us hold fast to the confession of hope. So this is found in Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So that the confession of our hope, our hope is in the Messiah. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the new covenant. Our hope is in, ever, ever since the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when, you've got to remember when Hebrews was being written, it's 70 or 80 years um, after Christ. And the, <clears throat> and the hope that they were trying to reveal to us is the hope that we have in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the new covenant that God had actually made with us as part of his humanity. It goes on <clears throat> a little bit further, and then, and then it says this. It says, Hebrews 10, 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Okay, so we're in shutdown. We all understand that we're in shutdown on these days. <clears throat> and the Lord hasn't told me to rebel against the system and open up and have the meetings. Um, so I'm just trying to obey the Lord and we're in this shutdown time. But what I do want to encourage you to do we have available to us all kinds of technical <coughs> uh, opportunities. And um, there's a few things that I want to say to us as a church. One is, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. And I would encourage you to gather together with your family and watch the videos. Don't watch it alone, you know, one here, one there, all spread over the household. But <coughs> pull your family together and watch it together. I believe you could probably set up Zoom meetings and watch it in groups. And um, I know I'm not, um, I'm just learning about Zoom myself. I'm not overly savvy, but you could invite a whole lot of friends in the Zoom meeting. Uh, you can see each other on the screen. You can have many people there. You can have 20, 30, 40, up to 100 people. You can see them on the screen. You could listen um, uh, uh, to the messages. So you're still gathering together. Even though we're not physically together, we can be actually together and actually participating together. It also says... Um, consider one another to stir up love and good works. And um, that's the other thing I want to encourage us to do, is become proactive 
in our relationships. It's time to get on FaceTime. It's time to get on your phones. It's time to get out there and actually build relationship with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maintain relationship. There's, we can still maintain relationship in a very productive and a very fruitful way if we just put on a little bit of extra effort. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a throat issue going on here, so I better have some of my uh, cappuccino. Okay, so these opportunities that we have through technology enable us to have meetings. So small groups, soul leaders, <clears throat> put in a little bit of effort, let's make a way, let's gather, let's meet, let's consider and stir one another up in, in the faith. <clears throat> there is, um, around the Zerubbabel temple and that too, and I did share with this because there's other scriptures that prophesy to these same areas from Zechariah chapter 6. And Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, it says this, Zechariah 6, 11, <clears throat> Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne, and he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. <clears throat> this is talking prophetically now. It is talking to Zerubbabel. It's talking to Joshua. It's talking now not about the natural temple they're going to build, but it's talking about a spiritual temple that Jesus himself is going to build out of the living stones, us, those, the living temple. <clears throat> the, um, there's quite a bit of um, uh, controversy that surrounds the whole revelation, the second coming, the end time, message and the revelation and Daniel and the revelations of the temple and the, uh, the desolation of destruction and these sorts of things. And um, there's some really th interesting things. So as I've been studying, going through some of the temple stuff, I've been coming across some of these things and really looking a little bit further into the scriptures related to this. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, about Matthew chapter 23 and 24 now. And uh, it's again... Um, it's about Jesus and it does relate to the temple. In Matthew 23, at the very end of the scriptures there, <clears throat> chapter 23, verse 37, the Lord says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing it's interesting, uh, when I read that um, earlier this week, uh, one of the things that stood out to me, I thought about the Ark of the Covenant and how the angels and the wings cover over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> the other thing that came back into my mind was when Jesus had taken the people out of Israel, he talked about gathering them up on eagles' wings. And here he's saying to Jerusalem, I've wanted to be a covering to you. I've wanted to have you come under my wings excuse me, and bear covering, but you were not willing to come under. And then it goes on, um, and it says this in the very last scripture in chapter 33 of Matthew. It says, and this is interesting, he says, See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then we go straight on into chapter 24, and it says this, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So when he said to them, Your house is left to you desolate, <clears throat> and from this time you shall see me no more, until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the Lord was speaking, there's two things going on there. One is the Lord is actually saying, This temple is desolate. And I believe he's saying that. He's saying the temple is desolate because there's no Ark of the Covenant in there. There's no presence of God in the, in the, in the temple. <clears throat> when Jesus Christ came on the earth, the era of the temple was over. The era of the sacrifices is over. And Jesus, I believe in these scriptures, he's actually pointing it out. For he says, <clears throat> your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, 
You shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his, his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus walks out of the temple. He basically puts like a curse on it. He said, this is place is desolate. He walks out of the temple, and then the disciples come. They're still excited about the temple. They come up, and they said they want to show him the buildings of the temple. <clears throat> And Jesus said to them, do you not see all of these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then it goes on in verse 3. And now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when, that will, when these things will be. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, <clears throat> There's, there's, there's an interesting thing here. So we see what's actually happening is they're asking the Lord three specific questions, which I believe the Lord answers and responds to them about these three specific questions. Um, <clears throat> first, what we've got to realize is there's a couple of symbolic things that are going on here. One is Jesus has quite clearly told them that the temple, their temple is desolate, right? It, this, is, this, this thing's finished. This thing's over. Number two is, Jesus could have stayed <clears throat> and taught them from the temple, but he went outside of the temple. You remember also in the scriptures where it talks about how Jesus went outside the city to die. He was crucified outside the city. And we understand from biblical revelation that when Jesus went outside the city to die, he was identifying not just with Israel, but he was identifying with all of humanity. He was outside of the city, he was outside of that place of grace. <clears throat> he went outside of the temple to talk to them about the end time things. He wasn't going to stay within the temple. It's a symbolic act, I believe, when he went out. <clears throat> I was studying also about the temple and realized that Jesus, um, uh, in, in the Gospels, it talks about how he cleansed the temple. And reading through these verses about the cleansing of the temple, temple there's quite an interesting revelation that comes out. In John chapter 2, verse 16, he says, he goes in, he cleanses the temple, and he says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. So this, this temple he's talking about is a temple. It's Herod's temple. It's a temple without the ark. It's a temple without the presence of God. But even then they had turned it into a place of merchandise. But I want, to, I want, you, want you to see this. <clears throat> Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. He cleanses the temple again. It's recorded in Mark chapter 11, verse 17. And in that instance, he says, Is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? So this is the second thing. First, he says, This is my father's house. Then he says, my house, this is my house, and he says, and my house shall be called <coughs> a house of prayer to all nations. But in Matthew 23, verse 38 and 39, he says, and your house shall be left desolate, for I say to you that you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There is never a, an instant in the Bible from this moment on in the history of Jesus Christ where he ever goes back into the temple. He does not return to the temple. <clears throat> the next time the Lord comes back into the temple, he's coming back to this temple. He's coming back to us, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. It's interesting because in Haggai 2.9, he says, The glory of the latter temper, temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And uh, it's an interesting thing because um, the glory of the latter house, uh, you know that creation God made uh, the Garden of Eden for humanity. He made it as a place for humans to dwell in. <clears throat> it was meant to be a place of rest. On six days the Lord created, and on the seventh day he said he entered into his rest. And uh, he made this place called Eden for humanity, and when we were in there, we were in a place of rest. You know, it's interesting because there were seven days of creation, and they actually also believe that there are seven days of, um, 
of the Lord actually uh, uh, reconciling us back to himself or of restoration. The seven days of creation enter into rest and then after the fall of humanity, <clears throat> there's seven days when God is restoring us, providing salvation and providing a saviour for us. We, we, we use those seven days, it says in the scripture, that a day is as a thousand years um, to the Lord. And we use those seven days as the seven days of redemptive history of Jesus Christ. We know now that we're in the, in the calendar um, uh, from uh, 4,000 years you know, through to Jesus Christ coming 2,000 years after the time of Jesus Christ. We are, we are right on the verge now. Well, I believe that we've entered into what they, <clears throat> the, at least the sixth day, we're right on the verge of the seventh day. That's why there's a lot of preaching going on about the end time, because this is the 7,000 year. <clears throat> we're heading right towards that time when there's going to be the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the 1,000 year reign, the millennial reign of Christ with his bride. The 1,000-year millennial reign, they, they call it, it's, a, it's going to be a season. Prophetically, it says it's going to be a time of rest. So God created in six days he worked, and on the seventh he rested in creation. And in redemption, he's been working with humanity for six days to provide redemption. And on the seventh day, with the millennium kingdom, we're going to enter into the rest of the Lord. <clears throat> I believe these things are very, very close. That's why I believe there's a lot of revelation and preaching about revelation and there's a lot of urgency now within the body of Jesus Christ because we're in this time. We're in this end time with the Lord. Okay, so the three questions. <clears throat> Tell us when these things are three. So he says, the temple is going to be destroyed and what not one stone is going to remain on another. And we know that, and, and that scripture says within this generation, and most often the, um, in the Bible, they talk about a generation. Most often it's 40 years. Some people say a generation is 80 years. There are various times. But what we do know from the time that Jesus Christ spoke this out, 40 years later, the temple was completely destroyed by Rome. They came in. They smashed it down. They dismantled the temple. Not one stone was left standing on top of another. It was a total destruction. And it was a total desolation. A desolation or a, a, the desolation of the, of the temple was the gross sacrifices and the things that they did within the temple. The destruction of the temple was the complete dismantling of the temple according to the prophecy of Jesus Christ so that not one stone was left on top of another. This prophecy was actually fulfilled right there. I believe it was actually fulfilled right there. In AD 70. <clears throat> um, so it says this, uh, Matthew 24, 15 and 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, you, you know historically about the dismantling, so let me say that. The second question he asked, that they asked is, and what will the sign of your coming? And in Matthew 24, 30, he says this. He answers the question. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. So what's the sign of his coming? He says, then the sign is the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Also, remember in the book of Acts, when Jesus Christ was resurrected, the, the apostles that were standing there watching him go, two angels appeared to them and said, you know, why are you gazing into the heaven? Because this Jesus that you see leaving in this way, in like manner, in his return, he's going to come back in the same manner. He's actually going to come back. <clears throat> So what will the sign of his coming be? The sign of his coming will be the Son of Man will appear in heaven. <clears throat> and um, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels 
with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from the end of the earth. Okay, so that's number two. Number three question is, and of the end of the age. We want to understand about the end of the age. Matthew 24, 13, 14 says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So it, it's, actually, it's actually really quick, clear. They make this into a big mystery, but it's not really a big mystery because it's actually revealed really right before our very eyes. And um, in the scripture, it's revealed, and it's very, very clearly revealed. He who endures to the end shall be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness <coughs> to all nations, and then the end will come. <coughs> so, you know, they do talk about uh, 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 a rapture. There's all kinds of doctrines and things that go around about a rapture, and we don't know the hour, we don't know the day, and there's a lot of scripture that sits in and supports around those things. <clears throat> but we do know that the, um, uh, there are some things that need to be fulfilled before the second return of Christ. One is that the gospel needs to be preached to every nation, which is, which is absolutely obvious here in the scriptures. And, uh, and, and this is the Lord actually speaking. This is Jesus speaking. Another is in the book of Acts where it says that um, God, uh, Jesus Christ is going to be held in heaven until the restoration of all things. I, I connect these scriptures up with um, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ when it says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born unto a man, or unto the earth, or unto, unto human. And when the fullness of God's time has come, Jesus Christ has returned. He will return. It's absolutely certain. Um, there's literally hundreds of detailed prophecies in the word of God talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, we probably can uh, move on <clears throat> in a little while and we can, um, we can talk about some of these things relating to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the, um, let me just give you uh, one or two verses just to sort of whet your appetite as we move ahead a little bit. Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. <clears throat> it talks about the days of Noah, you know, they were living and getting married and all of these sorts of things, and then the Lord, um, the judgment came and the Lord would come. Matthew 24, 39, and did, <clears throat> and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. This is relating to Noah. Uh, they didn't actually realise that judgment was coming until the flood came, and by that time it was too late. It says in Matthew 24, 48, but if, if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. Like, we go into the parables. After Matthew 24, we go over into a series of parables that are all end-time parables. And uh, we will have a look at them in the days ahead. We're going to have a look at some of those parables. But um, uh, there's some interesting things that um, uh, you discover in those parables, uh, like the, the, the virgins Five of them were ready to go, five of them weren't ready to go. But the five who didn't make it into the wedding feast of the Lamb, the reason they didn't make it was because they had no oil in their lamps. They had no Holy Spirit. They had, they had no presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They had no oil in their lamps. They couldn't make it in. There's, there's several... Um, actually, there's a, an, another series of studies that I have been doing, and it's, it's talking about the midnight hour. And uh, in the parable there of the ten virgins, it's talking about, it says that the bridegroom came in the midnight hour. And, um, but they couldn't get in to the marriage feast <coughs> of the lamb or with the bride because they had no oil. They had no Holy Ghost in their life and they weren't prepared to meet with them. You know, one of the things um, <coughs> that I believe that's really, really interesting and that has been something that has been challenging me is this concept of the full gospel of Jesus Christ. We, um, I remember um, uh, when I, not long after I got saved and I started coming into contact with Pentecostal people, 
the term full gospel was used over and over and over again. It was a very common term they talked about in those days. But it's not until recent years that I actually got a revelation and an understanding of what they were really talking about. What were, they, what were they saying? What were they meaning by the full gospel? Why is it during that time when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, the gift of the Holy Spirit came, why was there so much revelatory division that came into the church? Why did the born-again church oppose the Spirit-filled church so strongly? <clears throat> it's almost like a repeat of, the, of Judaism opposing the Messiah and now those who have received the Messiah as their saviour are opposing the outpouring and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the full gospel. But uh, I'm going to leave us there for uh, Sunday morning. And, um, and what we're going to do is uh, on Monday night, I'm going to start off with talking a little bit more about this full gospel. And then we're going to go in and have some, a look at some of the end time things uh, that I believe that God is revealing to us in these days. There's some interesting stuff. Uh, that the Lord is bringing to our attention. But I want to encourage you too, church, just uh, remember uh, to honour the Lord with the first fruits of your income, your tithes, your offerings, your blessings. I want to encourage your church to um, gather. If you can't physically gather, gather um, on face, uh, FaceTime, gather on Zoom, gather any way you can. Gather on the phone if you have to, but let's make contact. Don't get isolated. There's no need to be isolated because we have all the means available to us to actually remain in relationship, to remain in contact with each other. So um, keep up the faith, keep strong, be bold in the Lord. <clears throat> keep praying and believing that we're going to be released from this, uh, uh, this shutdown that is going on in our nation and the nations. And uh, we're going to be able to do everything that the Lord would have us to do. I honestly believe, I really believe, church, that we're going to come into a time of great harvest as part of the promise. For this season that we're entering into, there's a promise of harvest that is coming. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really, really excited about that. So God bless, be encouraged, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. Amen.